Salutations, Stanford. How are you on this splendid day? This week we are talking about narrative Stockholm Syndrome, or ways to render your character's interiority or consciousness in such a way that a reader authentically identifies with the character's set of experiences. So first, let's get a crass and probably way oversimplified definition of what Stockholm Syndrome is. Uh, so I think the best way, for, for our purposes anyway, in terms of putting narrative together, we can define it as a captee begins to sympathize or feel for a captor. So despite being, you know, held against their will, because they're spending so much time together, there's some sort of forced psychological identification that occurs. Um, obviously, that's a crude oversimplification of how that syndrome works. But again, for our purposes, that sort of definition will suffice. It is when a captee begins to sympathize with her or his captor. In this case, the metaphor that we're drawing from Stockholm Syndrome is that the captor, in the case of putting story together, will be the protagonist or point of view character. And the captee will be the reader who happens to be thrust into and embedded in that character's consciousness for the duration of the book or the duration of the chapter, depending on how many point of view characters there are. So I'm going to argue that narrative Stockholm Syndrome is one of the best things that we have to work with as a novelist. What we want to do is thrust our reader into the character's consciousness in such a convincing way that the reader has no choice but to identify with, sympathize with, and maybe even empathize with the person's mindset they happen to be contained in. And maybe the last one, empathy, is perhaps the one that we should be striving for the most. Because oftentimes in books, our characters are doing things that our reader herself may not do in her own personal life maybe saying things that the reader doesn't agree with, perhaps is even doing actions that contradicts the reader's moral coding. However, if we've struck that very delicate and precise balance of narrative Stockholm Syndrome, our reader has been so privy to the mechanisms of decision making that she completely understands why the character is saying these things. She totally understands why the character happens to be performing these actions. And in that process of understanding, that's when that bond is really being forged between reader and main character. We understand the mechanisms of the character's mind. We've seen the nuances of that particular player's psychology in such a way that the reader says, yes, even though personally I wouldn't behave this way. Personally, I would never say that. Personally, I would never do that. Because I understand this character's psychology so thoroughly, I completely empathize or I completely sympathize with what happens to be happening on that particular page in that particular scene. So as you're working on your novels this week, as you're working on what will be the next chapter, the next scene that you'll be writing, be thinking about this. How are you using this bond between reader and main character to your advantage? How are you taking advantage of the captor, captee paradigm that exists in narrative construction? If your reader is embedded in this mindset, how are you taking advantage of that incarceration? How are you trying to forge the deepest affinity possible between your reader in your main character. And I promise you that if you take the time to really dote on this psychology, to really dote on this relationship between protagonist's thought process or protagonist's logic system and reader, uh, you will start to impact your audience in a much more poignant way.
And as a, an aside, and as a byproduct of this, as the author, it will also greatly enhance your understanding of your own characters. So in a sense, an exercise like this is really doing double duty. In the front ground, yes, it is certainly impacting the reader's relationship to your character, the reader's understanding of your character's psychological realism, that is, why your character is doing what your character happens to be doing. And then, in the background, it's also greatly enriching your own knowledge base as to why your characters are doing what they're doing. Again, and to repeat myself for the umpteenth time about this, the best writers are the ones who are merely underpaid, scribbling secretaries. They let their characters drive. The best writers are the ones who are willing to observe their characters in the wild and in the midst of watching the characters stalk their organic habitats, we're learning more about the way they behave. We're learning more about the way they interact, react, act, so on and so forth. So an exercise like this will help you stay limber to the idea that as the author, you have to let the characters be in charge. And the more the characters are driving, the more authentic the book will seem and the more authentic the book seems, the more willing a reader is to suspend her disbelief and fall into the beautiful, natural rhythm of your narrative. Uh, or that's the idea, at least. So anyways, have fun playing with this this week. Be free on the page. Be reckless on the page. Turn your imagination loose to absolutely go nuts.